something to worship God about today, don't you think? Can you please come to your feet? As we continue on in our service today, in our Sunday school lesson, we were thinking about our blessings and thinking how God answers our prayers. Sometimes he doesn't answer them the way that we want him to answer them. But it all comes down to trusting him. So as we go in this time of quietness before the Lord and worship, I just want you to think about what the Lord is doing in your life. Uh, just the little things. We're going to worship Him for the little things today. The little things that we miss out on. Like waking up in the morning and our heart is still beating. You ever thought about that? Just waking up and your heart is still hitting the river. The little things. I'm learning from my grandma. The, the ability to breathe. Did you know that? You know, sometimes we take that for granted. Just to, just to wake up and go... Wouldn't your life be different if you couldn't do that? I think that's enough. Let's worship. Let's pray. Thank you,
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Part 2, 1866 to 1953. You're free, Lizzie. You ain't got to listen to Massa no more. Free, free, we can go, Elijah shouted. Lizzie slowly looked up from scrubbing her master's floor, a routine that had been a part of her life for 46 years. She said, free, free to go. Where I'm going? I ain't got nowhere else to go. This was a quandary. For many African Americans, after the news of freedom reigned throughout the nation, not only any means of sustaining themselves, let alone figuring out which way to go. Many freed slaves remained on their ex-master's land, for many sharecroppers became the means of providing a basic need of shelter, previously called the slave quarters. That's where they would get food and clothing, while for others, Remaining on the ex-master's land opened doors and opportunities to buy small parcels of land 
Some ex-slaves would partial by partial buy the master off the land. While this practice was more than an exception than the rule, it served as one of the catalysts of hope. The progress of the newly freed Americans also served to incite deep-seated violent actions by those who were completely against freeing, freeing people of color. The, though terrorist groups such as the Ku Klux Klan had, excuse me, had, had launched, had lynched cross and with cross burnings and fire bombings of homes, an e a epidemic of hope, strength, and equality was building momentum in the newly freed Americans. In 1867, five all-black colleges are founded. Howard University, Morgan State, Talladega College, St. Augustine, Johnson C. Smith. These are these will be more than 100 predominantly black colleges by the middle of the next century. In 1800, Henry O. Flipper is the first American, African American to graduate from West Point. In 1889, he will write a book about his experience the colored candidate of, the, of West Point, at West Point, excuse me. The Tuskegee Institute, a historic black university, is founded in Alabama to train African Americans as teachers in agriculture and industry, Booker, where Booker T. Washington is the first president. In 1890, while Mississippi, yeah, excuse me, enacts a poll tax, which most African Americans could not afford to pay to try to keep blacks from voting, Timothy Thomas Fortune, a freed slave and journalist, founded the National Afro-American League. In 1909, the National Association for Advancement of Colored People, NAACP, is founded by a group of African American and white activists. Between 1910 through 1920, the great migration of Southern African American to Northern industrial towns get underway. Millions of African Americans will have migrated north by the 1960s. Celebrate in 1940, Benjamin O. Davis Sr. became the first African American general in the U.S. Army. In 1948, President Truman issues an effective order of desegregation in the military. Richard Wright, Marion Anderson, Tuskegee Airmen, Con Congress of Radical Equality, known as CORE, Paul Robeson, Lena Horn, Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., Jackie Robinson, let us learn from our past and celebrate strength in the journey of the African American experience. In closing, we celebrate an old Negro spiritual, Swing Low Sweet Chariot, which actually refers to the Underground Railroad where fugitive slaves were welcome. This town is atop a hill by the, o by the Ohio River, which is not easy to cross. So to reach this place, fugitive slaves had to wait for the wait or help coming from the hill. If you would help me with singing this song, a little part of it. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me.
we did it Italian style. It is good to be able to embrace our brothers and sisters in the Lord. As we prepare for our gifts of love or our time of giving, we ask you to open those Bibles with me to the book of Psalms, specifically Psalm 121. Uh, for the last week or so, uh, this psalm has just been in my heart and I think it's very applicable uh, to our giving and us being blessed. So if you could turn to Psalm 121. On last Sunday and Sunday before, I let you know that uh, we definitely need your prayers. Hopefully within the next few months, uh, when the weather breaks well, we'll be making some repairs on our parking lot. And, uh, the back 40 out there, I hope we'll be getting that paid. And, uh, we want you to just pray for us, and we thank you for your giving. Um, we, we have taken our time to get to that point simply because we want to keep Ebenezer debt free. And you have given and given, and we thank you for that. We thank you so much. So look for that within the next few months prayerfully. Um, when they can come and do it properly, we'll be having that paid. Uh, during that time, we'll have more announcements. We'll have some parking rearrangements and some other things that we'll have to do uh, to accommodate them during that time. And hopefully, as the spring breaks, uh, you'll see some wonderful repairs going on here at Ebenezer. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Psalm 121. Look at this awesome scripture. I'm going to read it in its entirety. It's actually focused on Jerusalem, but it's focused on us also. It says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth, even forevermore. That last verse again says, The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth, and even forevermore. Saints of God, we have an insurance plan, and His name is Jesus. He's the Lord. He protects us and He keeps us. And that's why we can stay with that principle of the New Testament that God loves a cheerful giver. You can be cheerful knowing that God has your back and your front and your side and your top and your bottom. He has you all over. And to know that He'll never leave you nor forsake you. What a gracious God we we serve today. And as we give, our giving is not paying them off. I know when you go to a restaurant and you get a good uh, server, you, you tip them well, but we're not tipping God today. We're thanking God just because He's done exceedingly abundantly above what we can dare ask or think. And as we give, the church is able to reach out to others and bless them. And also for the good news of Jesus Christ, that more people can be saved and brought to the knowledge of the truth. If you think about it, it's a wonderful plan, how God uses our minute money. That's what it is, our minute money. And he turns it around, and he makes an impact on the world. I know all of us that are sitting here today that can say, God has truly blessed us in more ways than one. Amen. Have you ever been blessed and didn't have any money? Yeah. Amen. I was just broke as broke could be. But God was still blessed. All right, some of y'all getting excited about that. I just want to encourage you. Thank you so much for your liberal gifts. Thank you so much for reaching out to others. Thank you for blessing Ebenezer. I'm going to ask our officers to get ready to come forth. And I just want to pray uh, at this time. Uh, lift up our offering and lift up your lives and what the Lord is doing in Ebenezer. Father, I just thank you so much for your mercies. Wow, Lord, if we had 10,000 tongues, if we had millions upon millions, millions of dollars, 
we couldn't pay you for what you do for us. Thank you for this time in our service to give, Lord, to give freely, to give joyfully, that we don't have constraints upon us or restraints upon us or pressure. But, Lord, we can just give because we love you and you've done more than we could ever ask. Now, Lord, I know there's some here that are struggling, Lord. Some don't have jobs. and Some, Lord, just don't know how they're going to make it through the next week. So, Father God, I ask you to bless them also, for they have a desire to give, but they just can't give today. But, Lord, we thank you that you're the giver of all good and perfect gifts, Lord. And we love you that you provide for us even when we don't have money, Lord. Thank you for being a God that's more than enough. Now, Lord, I just lift up our officers. I lift up Ebenezer as a whole. Lord, we thank you how you provided for us over and over again, how you've allowed us to reach out to the nations, Lord. Thank you how you've just kept this church as a light on this corner to reach out to our community, uh, to this United States, to the world. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.
I go left it alone and not leave it. It is prayer time now. Prayer is just having a simple talk with God about whatever we are dealing with in life. Some of us are dealing with illness, financial variation and frustrations. Our others are even homes and jobs. But God is a provider. And he is a sustainer. While Deacon Blood is coming to lead us in our moments of meditations, let us be in prayer with him. Remember Sister Ruth Kelly, who was rushed to the hospital this morning. Those who are on our sick and shut-in list. And my spouse, who will be going back into the hospital on Monday morning. And this will, if my mind serves me correctly, will be the eighth time since August the 13th. This time, they will attempt to remove and replace her hip and femur. It has been told to me that this operation will last at least five hours, or maybe longer. But I do know God will be there. And if God, you know, I know that God is going to be in that operating room. And I pray that the Holy Spirit touch each and every one in that room as well. Amen. Real, real, oh, Jesus is real. This morning, and, and she just said, Give you all the glory. Yes, thank you. She had the Satan tried to work with her, but she said, No, Satan, I'm gonna to listen to the one that's gonna help me. And she yes. stood there on one foot this morning. I just look, Heavenly Father, thank, thank you, you for her testimony. Thank you, Lord. Thank, thank you for her faith in you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, Minister Lucas naming a few people, Heavenly Father, his thank wife, you. and there's some more heavenly yes. father he named. Help them to keep this strength. We visit them, Heavenly Father, in their Thank home. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful. You said we, you told us that we have not because we ask not. Thank you, Jesus. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, not for ourselves, but we pray thanking you, Heavenly Father, for being a blessing to all of us. Thank you, Jesus. Most of all, Heavenly Father, teach us pray. Yeah. And teach us what to pray and how to pray. 
Thank you, Lord. Because Heavenly Father, without you, we could be doing nothing. Thank you, Jesus. Every breath that we breathe and every time we breathe and we inhale and exhale, it's all about you, Jesus. You yes. use this breath. Thank you, Jesus. Help us to use this breath to glorify you, Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this mail course back here that you started and you taught, told me, Heavenly Father, years and years ago that you you, you, you wanted a mail course to, to sing the words of, of your songs in this in this church. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. They, they have been here not just trying to show for themselves, but Heavenly Father, thank you for the love that, that the mail course explains and, and through the songs, Heavenly Father, Thank continue you. to bless the mail course, Heavenly Father. They will always sing the songs that will glorify you. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Thank Father, you. we're going to come now to the pulpit. Heavenly Father, thank you for our leader. Heavenly Father, he's so understandable. He, he, he lets us all know that your word is not to be messed with. Just, just say it like it is. And yes. we just thank you, Heavenly Father, for him teaching and preaching your holy word. Now, Heavenly Father, I want to ask, thank you for giving me an opportunity to stand right behind this altar this morning, Heavenly Father, and call upon your righteous and holy name. Without you, Heavenly Father, I could not be here. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for the ones that is here under the sign of my voice this morning, that they could have been anywhere and everywhere, but they came here this morning. Thank you for our visitors that came out this morning to hear your word because your word, Heavenly Father, will sustain us and keep us going. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all of the members of this church, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, bless the nation, bless the leaders of this country, bless the leaders of North Carolina, and Heavenly Father, just bless all of Thank us that we will continue Jesus. to look to thee which come out of hell because you are so real. Thank you, Heavenly Jesus. Father, bless the message that our pastor is going to deliver to us because you have already told him what to speak and say to us today. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, let us not sit in judgment, but let us listen and understand, Heavenly Father, that the words that you have sent to us, that we will be, it will be food to our soul, that we can grow out and go next week and we can tell someone, Thank Heavenly you, Father, Jesus. about your goodness and your word. Heavenly Father, continue to bless us. We will continue to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. It's in our name, in your name, Jesus, that we pray and ask these blessings. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Brother Tony, tell them about your testimony. Let me tell you, Brother Leroy.
come to you and we just say thank you. You are definitely a wonderful keeper. When we lost it, you were there. You enabled us to have another day to worship and praise you. Lord, now that we hear at your word, Lord, I ask you Thank to you, just move in a mighty way. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this Thank place for I'm incapable of teaching you. and yes. preaching properly within myself. Thank you, Jesus. Thank Father, you. I pray that even as the word comes forth Thank today, you, Thank that someone would believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus, Thank your son, is Lord. Amen. And Father, you have raised him from the dead. Thank you, now, Father, as we enter into the scriptures today. I pray that you'll be in my eyes and my seeing and my mouth and my speaking, my heart and my understanding. Lord, thank you for your anointing that's already here, that's touching hearts. Lord, I pray that you get past our tough exteriors and speak to that tender part of us where all permanent change takes place. We just give you the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you ready for God's word today? Amen. We ask you to please grab those Bibles and let's go back to where we were on last Sunday, Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, we introduced that section and talked about Cornelius, a Gentile in Caesarea who was giving alms and praying. God sent an angel to speak to him. We want to progress in that story. I summed it up on last Sunday, but it's just been on my heart. So Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. I want you to start looking at the ninth verse. Acts chapter 10. The ninth verse. The ninth verse, it reads, The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Verse 9 again. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. I want to speak from the subject today, a prayer that changes everything. A prayer that changes everything. As we are transitioned from last Sunday to this Sunday at Cornelius' house, we were actually in a place called Caesarea. Now there this Gentile Cornelius went down on his knees and began to pray unto the Lord and as he sought the Lord, God saw fit to send an angel to let him know that he needed to contact a Simon Peter that was staying at the Tanner's house. Now this is very important as we noted on last Sunday for the Gentiles had not yet been introduced to the Holy Spirit. Uh, we could say in a sense that God was tearing down racial walls. Simply because the Jews, as they looked at the Gentiles, they saw them as unclean. They saw them as dogs. They saw them as even not a person, not having rights. Uh, the Jews felt that they were the only ones who were called of the Lord and could be anointed. But Cornelius had been touched by the good news of Jesus disseminating throughout the area. And because of that, he saw fit to pray to God and we all know in here, when we pray to God with a sincere heart, God can change things in our lives. As uh, says this centurion Cornelius comes out of his prayer time, the angel speaks to him. He sets forth three servants to go to Joppa to find this Simon, Peter. Now this is important because Caesarea is to the north of Joppa, and Joppa is actually 30 miles away. So these three servants, under the inspiration, under the direction of Cornelius, go to find Simon Peter 30 miles to the south. And here we pick up this ninth verse. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. 
a prayer that changes everything. Now remember Cornelius, he was up in prayer at 3 p.m., but on the next day, God is already setting up an interaction. He's setting up a prayer that's going to connect with a lot of people that lives are going to be changed. I just want to stop here today and think about this scripture a little bit. Some of you have been praying for some things, but I believe God is moving on your behalf. Sometimes you can be praying for things and you can't see what God is doing on the other side. Remember Cornelius, he gets that vision, that angel has spoke to him, but he really doesn't know how God is going to work it out. How often have we questioned God, how he's moving in our lives? There's some old saints in here that can denote that he may not show up when you want him, but aren't you glad that he's always on time? Have you ever prayed to the Lord not knowing how he was going to work it out, and all of a sudden his answer slipped up on you? You ever been blessed, and you didn't even realize how blessed you was. And then a, a few days after that you thought about it. You said that was an answer to my prayer. And all of a sudden you got excited about his grace and his mercy. The next day Peter is in connection with this powerful prayer that Cornelius prays. And these three men are on the way to Peter's house. But Peter does not know that God is setting him up. How many things are going on in our lives right now that we don't know that God is setting us up? How many answers are on their way? But we don't know that they're on their way. We, we, we don't know that they're getting ready to knock at our door. The answer that we've been praying for, the movement of God that we've been desiring, a prayer that changes everything. Peter, because this is his habit after meeting the Lord, walking with him, seeing his death and his burial and his resurrection, he would go up often three times during the day to pray. And this time he goes up the sixth hour, the scriptures say, which is 12 noon to the housetop. There's something about the housetop in Jerusalem. It's noted from history. This is the place that you would relax at. This is the place that you would go on top of your house and you felt like you would be closer to the Lord. Peter goes up and prays, but notice verse 10 and 11. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheep bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. A prayer that changes everything. It's just a regular day for Peter. He's sharing the good news, the gospel, but he goes up on the housetop and he prays. And I think we can recognize that there's been many times that I've gone in prayer and you've gone in prayer and you just got hungry. You, you were talking to the Lord, but the physical side of you was desiring to eat. And because he was on the housetop, Sister Peter must have been down in the kitchen and the servants there. And maybe they were cooking up some good fried chicken and and as he was praying to the Lord, trying to stay focused, all of a sudden he became very hungry. You, you, you ever been there in your prayer closet praying and you smell the aromas from the kitchen coming out and, and you want to say, Lord, I love you, you know, but that, that food smells so, so good. So what God does, as Peter is very hungry, actually in a fasting state of a type, all of a sudden Peter falls into a trance in his prayer time. A prayer that changes. It's a strange dream because as he's in this trance, he sees heaven open up. And as the heavens open up, an object like a great sheep bound at the four corners, a, a, like a blanket of a tight, comes down. It descends to him and it was let down to the earth. A prayer that changes everything. Don't, don't forget the background. The centurion, uh, has, uh, Cornelius, has prayed. And, and God says, I'm going to bring you an answer so you can understand who I really am. And now God is moving on Peter's side, which is a Jew. And the Jews and the Gentiles don't even talk. But when God gets in the midst of it. Uh, there's some of you that has some enemies in your life. But when God got in the midst of it, when God began to work it out, a prayer that changes everything. Look at the next verse 12. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth. Wild beasts, creeping things, and birds 
of the year. Now, now Peter is hungry and the sheep comes down and all these animals are inside this blanket of a tight and he's able to look into it as he's in the trance. Notice we see all kinds of creatures, four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, all things. Now this is very important. There were unclean animals and clean animals within the sheep. Now, those who have background in the Old Testament can understand for the Jews, God had given to Moses the types of things that they were supposed to eat. For instance, they weren't supposed to eat pork. They weren't supposed to eat certain types of animals uh, simply because how many legs they had or where they were at. And all of these things came together. And Peter, being an Orthodox Jew, he understood, I can't eat everything that's in the sheet. And so at this point, he's perplexed because after he looks at all of these clean and unclean things within the sheep, all of a sudden God speaks in verse 13 and a voice came to him, rise Peter, kill and eat. A prayer that changes everything. What, what happens in your life when you have a preconception of the way things should be, but God comes in and talks to you and tells you how things are right now? Some of you didn't get that. What happens in your life when you thought that this was the way it was supposed to be because you know Papa told you that and the world told you that and Buki told you that that's how it was supposed to be but when God's word showed up God shows up to Peter and says Peter I, I understand what you thought I said in the Old Testament but please understand what's in the sheep I don't want you to discern between the unclean and the clean I want you to get up I want you to rise and I want you to kill and I want you to eat but this is a problematic because being an orthodox Jew, they do not eat unclean things, but yet it is the Lord that's speaking. I think I struggle with having a, a prayer that changes everything. It's coming to the point of hearing God's voice and knowing it's God's voice and saying, God, not my will, but let thy will be done. Have you ever thought you understood something in your life, but yet when you got into the scriptures and began to study and meditate, you realized that your mind was all discombobulated, messed up, that you got it all wrong, and then you had to go back to somebody and tell them, I was messed up, I made a mistake, I didn't understand it, but now I understand it. And then you got to deal with pride because you got to humble yourself. But now Peter is caught up within himself. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, don't forget, the prayer was started with Cornelius in Caesarea, which is 30 miles away. Now God is moving at Peter's house, putting the puzzle together. Aren't you glad for a God that can work on the left side and the right side? He can work to the north and he can work to the south. Even at the same time, the next day all these things are happening, but notice the character of Peter. Even though Peter has been saved, he's been delivered, he's been set free, he still has some of that old man on the inside. I'm finding out, I've been talking to my wife about this, I realize that that flesh is on the inside of us, and it seems like the closer you get to the Lord and seeking him and praying and having your family devotion, the devil wants to step up in your life. You ever buried the old man, put him six foot under, pack the dirt down, and all of a sudden that joker started raising to a few. Some of you have been saved all your life, but I'm talking to the real folk that have to fight every now and then, that have to believe God. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or clean. Now, now this is a, a simple scripture on one side, but it's complicated because remember, he knows that the Lord said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But, but all of a sudden the Lord has told him to do something but Peter he's known for his strong will and some of us are strong will he said uh uh not so Lord now now this is this is complicated as you look closely because not so Lord doesn't go together let me explain to you first he says not so to the Lord Lord means that I'm in charge of whatever I want you to do therefore if I tell you to rise up and eat then you support because I'm your Lord that's what you call me Lord so you can't put not so together with Lord because when you put not so with Lord that means that he's not Lord did you get that See, some of us are struggling in our lives because you say that he's your Lord, but you keep telling him no. Lord, I know what it says in your scripture, but the Lord, you, you don't understand. You don't understand. I've been doing this all, all this time, but Lord, I would, I know you speaking to me, but no, this is Peter. He says, not so, and then he just 
testify not so Lord for I have never eaten anything common or unclean but Peter, I, I love him because he has the personality that we all have. He says, first of all, God, because you're Lord, maybe you don't realize this, that, that you know what, I'm an Orthodox Jew. I'm, I'm clean. And, and, and because I've never eaten unclean thing, I think in his mind, he was thinking that somehow that made him holy. There's some of you, let me explain it in this vernacular. Some of you think just because you come to church every Sunday and your daddy was a preacher or your daddy was a deacon or you know how to sing Amazing Grace, that all of a sudden that makes you more spiritual than other folks that are struggling just to make it into the house of the Lord, that are struggling just to keep from cursing, but we know about the goodness of the Lord within our life. You think that somehow, just because you eat better than we eat, and you exercise better than we exercise, and you got a, a praise and worship CD in your car, that all of a sudden that makes you so sanctified and so holy, but God said, he said, no, God, I've never done that bad stuff. And you, you're, you're not getting a prayer that changes everything because when God comes in with a mighty prayer answer, all of a sudden it's going to change your life. That's how you know you're saved. If you have not been challenged in your life, if you had to get had to give up some stuff, and you haven't had to cry in the midnight hour, if you hadn't want, had to push down those emotions, that's only can I just talk to a few folks in here? You ever been mad, mad? I'm talking about real mad, real mad at somebody, and you want to deliver. I can just take a little bit more time on this verse. Do we try to explain to God what we going through? <laughs> I know you created the heaven and earth to see and all that is in them. You do miracles, signs and wonders. You make sure the sun is shining. Your, the stars are in, in the universe. You do all of that, but you don't understand what I'm going through. You, you, you don't understand what I need. You, you, you don't understand, God. Look at verse 15. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common or unclean. Now, 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 now notice it's very it's a progression. He speaks to the first time, and then all of a sudden, because Peter was so staunch in his attitude, not so, Lord, God has to speak to him again. What time are you on in your life-changing prayer? What time are you on and God is trying to change your thought patterns and the way you think because he wants to bring you out of Egypt. He wants to bring you out of bondage. He wants to bring you out of that pain and those struggles. He wants to release you from that boyfriend or that girlfriend or that job that you got fired from 10 years ago but you still can't let it go. He wants to lead you, release you from trifling family members that you can't let go. They done gone on with their life doing what they want to do but yet you still waking up in the midnight hour mad at them wanting to call them and text them with bad stuff. He wants to release you but yet not so Lord. I, I'm happy with where I am. I, I, I'm, I'm happy with, with my lifestyle. I'm, I'm happy with Jesus just you and me right now as long as you don't want me to change. I'm happy. I'm happy coming to church but just don't ask me to change my lifestyle. Just don't ask me to think differently. I, can I just come and just be me and do me and, and do what I want to do and, and God you speak stuff but that I want to go. Why you got to challenge me? Jesus says first of all you, you got to understand I'm God. And, and, I, and I know your understanding of the Old Testament what was clean and unclean but I'm coming back now because I'm really not talking about food. I'm, I'm using a symbol that's bigger than food. Oftentimes we're caught up in these base things but God is trying to do life changing things in our lives and he uses the stuff that we can understand to get us to the spiritual applications that will change our entire lives. And God says this awesome thing. He says what God has cleansed you must not call unclean a common. God 
God says, based on what you need to understand, when I clean it. See, some of you, the symbolics here, you see, some of you are still not accepted by certain folk because they know how you used to be. They know you. They know you. You were mean and hateful, and some of you still working through some stuff, but you're not like you used to be. And, and they don't accept you because they think you're going to backslide at any time. But what they don't understand, what God has cleansed. I know I ain't all that, that I should be. I, I, I know I may not be as holy as your aunt is. I, I Look at verse 16. A prayer that changes everything. It says, this was done, look at this, three times. And the object was taken up into heaven again. Peter couldn't get it the first time. Not so, Lord. Not so, Lord. I, I, I never eat nothing clean, anything unclean. The second time, she comes back down. He's able to see in. And God says, what I've cleansed. Now don't call it unclean or common. It goes back up. And then the third time, because Peter still didn't get it, it comes back again so he can see and he can think about what God has said three times and then the object was taken up again into heaven. Now, I wonder in your life, as we're talking about a prayer that changes everything, where are you? Has God already given you the answer, but you just don't want to take it? God has already told you what to do, and you know that it was the Lord, but you're still working it out. You're still trying to figure it out. You're saying, God, if I do what you told me to do, then they're going to do this, and they're going to do that. The fact is, you don't know what they're going to do. And then the other fact is, it doesn't matter what they do. As long as I do what the Lord tells me to do, God can I just talk to you a little bit? I think we have struggled in our prayer life because we want to be God. We want to control folks. We want to pray a prayer and then all of a sudden God just jumped to our beat the way that we think it should be answered. But we cannot control God nor can we control, control other people within our lives. But we can leave it with the Lord and we can say, God, just speak to me. I, I, I would like them to change, but Lord, just speak to me. I, I would like their lives to be touched, but Lord, just speak to me. God, help Let me hurry to the conclusion. Verse 17. Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold the men who had been sent from Cornelius 30 miles away to the north in Caesarea had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the king. Isn't God awesome? Peter is up on the house, stop praying. The vision of the trance has come to him. And while he's praying, God is softening up his heart. God is making sure, even though Peter still doesn't understand at all, the people from Cornelius' house are knocking at the door. How many of us got our answer right now, knocking at the door, but you still don't get it? You still don't get it. Some of you pray for God to provide for you, and look at you now. You got food in your kitchen. You got food on your table. You got food in your bed. Some of you are so blessed, got a little refrigerator that sits beside your bed where you can put your personal chocolate in and your drinks of the night so you don't have to walk over to the kitchen. But now you can reach in and get your bottle of water. But yet, you still complain. Peter, can't you see? He's, he's wondering, what, what's, Lord, what's going on? I, I'm, I can't eat this stuff. I'm, I'm hungry and it's a trance. I'm, I'm waking out of this. But God says, I got a backup. I, 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 after three times coming to you, I got the folks that are at your house and they're going to let you know that I'm moving in a special way. Now, this is very important to note as we, we enter into this portion of the scripture. God could have just came out and just been very point blank to people. But instead, God kind of goes around and he gives these symbols and he gives Peter time to work things out. See, sometimes God is not direct, but he's working out another piece of the puzzle. And God knows if I just tell you directly, then the other piece of the puzzle is not going to get there in time. So what I got to do is make sure that the intersection, the changes meet at the right time. Have you ever seen God move at the right time, at the right place? Some of you have been struggling to win your life and all of a sudden God set up the intersection at Walmart and your blessing came through. Some of you didn't know it, but you were struggling with God. You were fighting with the Lord and you were driving your car and all of a sudden somebody old got in front of you or somebody texting on their phone and they were going all slow and you got upset and mad and you were getting ready to give them some kind of wave with your hand, but all of a sudden God spoke to you and said, if you had not slowed down right here, you didn't know that the devil wanted to take you out at the other intersection. 
verse 18, just a few more verses. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. Now, now remember, they're coming from uh, that centurion. They're, they're coming from Cornelius' house, 30 miles away. They looked through the city. Remember, the angel told Cornelius in that vision to go to Simon the Tanner's house. That's where Simon Peter is going to be at. So they knock at this door that they've never been at before, and they said, is Peter up there? Well, we just got directions from our master, but, but we, we, we heard from the Lord through our master that Peter is lodging here. Can, can you get him for us? Look at verse 19. While Peter thought about the vision, he's up on the housetop. All right. The spirit said to him, behold, three men are seeking you. Man, as I get older, this is awesome. I'm finding out that nothing is by chance. Even the fact that you're here today, nothing is by chance. I love it when people testify and say, I was late to church, so I stopped by Ebenezer. Or, or you know what, I was just going by, and all of a sudden I saw this church, and I just slid in. I love those testimonies, because I know God is up to something. I, I know he's up to something. I, I love it when I see folks come in, and they're looking around, they don't know where they're going to sit at, and they're struggling. I know God is up to something, because now God is going to take you out of your comfort level, and he's going to put you beside that very downstairs. I, I, I'm going to give you a physical example of what's going on here. You were caught up with the food, but Peter, this is bigger than you are. Three men are seeking you. Now, now remember, three times, three times that vision or that trance comes down, and then three men. It's, it's at 12 noon. Remember, Cornelius prayed at 3 o'clock. You think God is working some things out here? All right, all right. Look at this verse 20. Last verse of the day, and I'll summarize it. It says, Arise therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing. For I have sinned. Now, I don't want to, no, you can't miss the background here. A prayer that changes everything. There are three men that are at his door that are Gentiles. Now, 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 this could be compared to a race relations here because you can only imagine what, if this was in a, a slavery time and, and, and Peter was the, the, the Caucasian or the white man and he did not interact with blacks and all of a sudden he gets a trance that says, what I've said, clean, uh, don't, don't call unclean. And then God says, rise up. And then Peter's going to go to the door and he's going to see somebody who's black. He's going to see three men that he's never interacted with, but yet God said, don't look at the color of their skin. All right. Don't look at where they came from, because I'm in the midst of this. Aren't you glad that God is not determined by our background, where we grew up, who we were? I'm so glad about it. Aren't you glad that just because your daddy was such and such and your mama was such and such? See, some of you are excited about your pedigree, but there's some folks in here that I God and he was worthy of all the praise remember 
a few Sundays ago, we talked about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, couldn't you just pray with me an hour? He went three times into the Garden of Gethsemane. And finally, Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but let thy will be done. Could that be compared with not so, Lord? Aren't you glad that Jesus didn't say not so, Father? But he said, Father, not my will, but let thy will be done. Could Peter be thinking back to the fact that Jesus was betrayed by Judas Iscariot? transcoming to me this three times. Maybe he's trying to get my attention when I denied the Lord three times and I could have been cursed for the rest of my life. But after Jesus died and was put in the cold grave three days later, he gets up with all power and all glory and then a few days after that he finds me. The one who said, I don't even know the Lord. The one who said, I didn't even walk with him and then I even cursed Jesus said that three times. So now Peter is saying, God, if you can work with me in three, I can trust you right now. I don't know where I'm going, but when I think about how good you are, I don't know what tomorrow holds for me. But Lord, I love you right now. And if you say go, in spite of my issues and my hang up, I'm still going to praise you. I just want to, there's a few folks in here. You don't know how God is going to work it out. You struggles that are in your life right now but you said Lord if you said it that settles it I don't understand I may have to hurt through the midnight hour I may have to cry probably tears but I know that weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in are there any joy warriors in here I'm running right now but Lord I don't know what's going to happen next week but why I got breath in my lungs right now why I got a reasonable portion of my health and my strength I had time just to finish this off, but I, I feel the Lord just wants me to stop here. Some of you are right down in the middle of your breakthrough. You've been putting the Lord off over and over again. I, I'm coming to the Lord when I get my life right. When I kick my girlfriend out or I kick my boyfriend out or I, I stop sleeping around, then I'm going to come. Please, it don't work that way. You come to Jesus as you are. And then Jesus changes you from the inside out. You can't do it within yourself. I'll, I'll, I'll come to the Lord when I let the drug habit go. It, it don't work that way. Come to Jesus as you are. Say, God, I believe you. I believe you. I don't know how you're going to work it out. Peter didn't know, but he goes with them. He goes to a place he's never gone before. He talks to people that he literally hated. But God said, I cleaned them up. I'm going to show you something. Maybe you're here today. You've been questioning God, how are you going to work my life out? How you going? How you going to fix me? I, I'm too far out there. I got too many issues. I got too many struggles. I can't be fixed. Some of you said that you're only here because mama invited you. Daddy told you to come. But you're saying my life can't be fixed. There are too many temptations. I want to let you know the devil is alive. See, Pastor, how do you know that? If he did it for me, he can do it for you. He's no respect of persons. He can move. He can change lives. If you're here today, what a wonderful day on Communion Sunday to give your life to the Lord. Some of you know you need to be baptized. Some of you have accepted Christ, but you, you haven't done that open confession. That symbol of going under the water and coming. You know, you know God has been speaking to you. Some of you got baptized when you were a little baby. 
And you know, you know, I need that experience in my life. I'm saved. I love the Lord. But I want to go under again. I, I, I want to know without a shadow of doubt. I am clean. 